My name is Dr. Kevin Pekka. I want to make a podcast that exposes people to the true miracles of life and health. All the guests on this show have been specially picked because they bring something positive to the world. They have some of the most amazing and inspiring life stories. These people have a passion for living, healing, and leaving the world better than they found it. There is something inside these people that made them keep fighting through all the tough times, even when people told them it was not possible. They carried on and made their lives beautiful again. And now they are sharing their experiences with the world. This is the Expect Miracles podcast. Enjoy the show. Today on the Expect Miracles podcast, we have Dr. Peter Reisenen. In the blink of an eye, for better or worse, life can change in an instant. Dr. Peter was coming home from a regular day of working out and class at the University of Arizona when a car hopped the curb, crashed into a traffic light pole, and the pole ended up falling on the back of Dr. Peter's head and neck, leaving him with a very serious traumatic brain injury. Now, despite what you have heard, it is entirely possible to recover from a serious brain injury. Dr. Peter is living proof of that. It is not easy, but with extreme determination and an undenying will to get better, the body can heal from almost anything, and you can get your life back. Dr. Peter discusses his long recovery process, his solo cross-country bike trip after the injury for charity, and how it led him on the path of what he is now as a naturopathic doctor. His story is truly amazing and inspiring, and it was an honor to sit down and talk with the life doc, Peter Reisenen. Hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Pete, how are you doing today? Excellent. Thanks for having me on the podcast today, Kevin. Absolutely. It was so much fun being on your podcast last week, getting to know you a little better. I know you have an amazing life story and a great recovery story. It's very inspiring. So I'm very excited to jump into that and all the people you're able to help with natural medicine and remedies and just getting people better. That's what the podcast is all about. So before we jump into that, I would just like to get started and ask you, Pete, where are you from originally? I was born in Royal Oak, Michigan at Beaumont Hospital, but anyways, grew up mainly in Arizona almost my whole life. I'm probably about 20-something years of my life have been here in Arizona. Five years were in Minnesota. We lived, did live on a farm in Minnesota, actually two different farms, and that was really a neat experience. That's where my dad grew up, so it was kind of interesting as a young kid to kind of see that, go into the barn and help him milk the cows and, you know, do all that yeah. stuff and life there compared to here in the city. There's a huge contrast between living in the country and living in the city. So, but I've lived in the city for most of my life. I feel like there's a big misperception about Arizona in general, because when I moved out West of California, I visited a couple times and it was not what I expected going from Phoenix, Scottsdale, Sedona, Lake Havasu, all completely different areas in one state had no honestly this is going to sound ridiculous i had no idea it gets freezing cold in arizona it gets so cold here in the winter it gets cold in that state absolutely everybody thinks it's just desert and it's hot it is it gets cold the (laughs) The desert's actually really cold in the winter i mean one of the survival tips that survival experts will give is if you get caught in the desert one of the things you have to have with you is a pair of pants you got to have long sleeves pair of pants things like that because it gets so cold at night because it's so dry. The temperature changes so drastic that like here in the winter, you could have like a 60 degree winter day and at night in the desert, you could be 25, 30 degree. I mean, you could be freezing. So, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I went camping in the Grand Canyon a week before Christmas and I didn't check the weather and there was snow on the ground and it was freezing. It was the coldest night of my life. (laughs) Epic. Absolutely epic. And here, this is coming from a guy who's in New Jersey, right? So come on. Yeah. yeah. It's the uh, level of preparation, right? I love. Oh, absolutely. We did a, a recent stay there and we had like 30 to 40 mile per hour winds just howling through camp, man. It was absolutely frigid on the rain. Yeah. Dr. Pete, what were you into growing up as a kid? Growing up as a kid, I loved golf and I loved hockey. So nice. Those years in Minnesota, lots of pond hockey. And then there, so the town we lo- grew up close to, my grandparents and my dad grew up in is called Cocado, Minnesota. Not many people in the town. I don't even know the population, but if I had to just throw a wild guess, I'd probably say between five and 10,000 people in the area. Wow. Pretty small town. And 
the pond and the rink was right across from my grandma and grandpa's house. So we'd go skate all the time. And so there's um, nothing better than playing pond hockey. That's easily my favorite winter activity. Absolutely. I mean, so that was my major activity and I brought that to Arizona with me and started playing roller hockey when I moved here. So I played a lot of roller hockey, which is unique, of course, because it's yes, absolutely. Than skates, of course, but uh, still a lot of fun though. Yeah. Still a lot of fun just getting out there. Absolutely. Yep. yep. So that, and then, uh, so between the three, yeah. Hockey, golf, I played a lot of golf starting in middle school. I played like every summer cause it was like a junior membership and mom, you know, I think it was 25 bucks for a year. And so mom wow. and I could play for five bucks all day long. So my mom would just drop me off at the golf course and say, have fun. And that was her way of getting rid of me for the, <laughs> for the day. So a win for everybody, a win for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, did you always have a passion for becoming a doctor and healing and everything? Or was that something you found later on in life? Something I found later in life. I really admired my grandpa growing up as well as my father, but my grandpa really stood out. I thought he was such a smart guy. He was a very analytical guy. Very, He's a lot more analytical than I am. And I always admired his ability to be so. And I thought I wanted to be an engineer until I got into high school and started getting into math and like mm. junior, senior year in high school, I said, forget this yeah. stuff. And I was like, all right, I'm going to go do something totally different. So yeah. yeah, I had no idea though I was going to become a, go into medicine in any capacity until later on in life. Yeah. So, I mean, you had a pretty significant life altering event happen to you and it changed the course of your life. Absolutely. It did. And but, it was the best thing that happened, and it was the craziest thing that happened, and it's the reason I'm here today. It's such a crazy, unexpected thing. Before we jump into it, I'm curious to ask you what the f- previous days and weeks were like for you before the event happened. Oh, wow. That's amazing. It's actually a really, really good question and not one that people ask, but it actually frames the story in a really uh, unique way. So I was training for a half Ironman in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and I was running a lot. I was biking a lot. I had straight A's at the University of Arizona. I was pre-med. I was working on, and I was pub- I had published a research paper that, or actually a case report that was put in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery with a mentor of mine who's a pediatric surgeon. I was working on all these different projects, and, and I actually, life was too easy. Mm. I actually remember that feeling of like, okay. Really? Yeah. I remember that. Like that was just, it was got goosebumps. Jeez. All right. Yeah. Life was too easy. And I remember laying in bed one night thinking, wow, if this is all it's going to take is to keep doing these things that I'm doing, like this isn't going to be whatever. I mean, there wasn't much of a challenge in it. I remembered from a sermon that I had heard at church that they had said, pray for trials in life. Mm. Actually, I remember that was about a week prior to the accident. I actually prayed for trials in life that my faith would be strengthened and that life. What? Oh my God. Which is crazy because I didn't remember that until years later. And I was thinking, oh my goodness. Yeah, that was a really, and because kind of things come back to you over time. And that was something. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That, and so that I distinctly well, remember that. Ask and you shall receive my friend. That's oh right. My gosh. Yeah. So that's what happened. Okay. So walk us through that week. What was going on? We'll we'll get into what happened. So at the University of Arizona, I was studying nutritional science and I was studying for my minor in chemistry, a week to week basis. I mean, I had classes and then I was a teaching assistant. They hired me as a graduate teaching assistant as an undergrad. So I was doing teaching a lot of first years and second years, the intro to to nutrition course. I was doing that on Fridays. And so I would I made my own presentations and ran that about a hundred undergrad students that I was helping learn the fundamentals of nutrition. And that I was also working on another research paper for the pediatric surgeon that I had published the original case report for and some research and doing actually IRB approvals and stuff. So, and then I was going to the gym. So it would wake up in the morning, like a day for me would be like, wake up at five in the morning, five 30, go for a bike ride up near, there was a a mountain pass called Gates Pass in Tucson. And that would be like a 25 mile ride. That was like where I I just started getting into biking. I had bought a bike from the golf coach at the University of Arizona. And so I just dove right into it. And then I would go swimming sometimes, work out, but I was studying during the day. And my place where I lived 
was like five blocks from the U of A. So I lived off campus, but I was so close that it was relatively like on campus. I mean, I just bike to school or walk to school or something like that. So daily activities were wake up, go and exercise, come back to the apartment, eat something, head to school, be there all day long studying. You were going, you were on the go all day long. Go, go, go. Wow. And I had a lot of responsibilities at the time too. So how did you feel? Did you feel pretty good? Were your energy levels good? Or were you like, I'm spread too thin right now? This is too much. Well, looking back, I know that even from what I remember, I remember I was feeling that like things were pretty good, but I, I was missing something. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Like things were humming along. People from the outside looking in would be like, man, everything's going great for him. Like he's just, he's doing it. He's taking care yeah. of business. So, but something was missing for sure. Mm-hmm. And I would come home on the weekends. My home here is in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I was down at the University of Arizona, which is in Tucson. So I'd come home on Friday night. I would often work. I worked in the neonatal intensive care unit when I was in college in town. And then when I went to the U of A, so I was in community college here. I was working at the hospital. And I kept that job when I went down to Tucson. And I would come back on the weekends and work like a shift. Maybe it would be a Saturday or an overnight or something like that. Just kind of something to keep my feet in the medical, in the hospital still. Even though I had so many hours, it didn't really matter whether or not I kept hours up in the hospital. It was kind of like, you know, it was was money coming in and it was a, it was a fun job. So I Mm -hmm. really enjoyed it. Yeah. So what exactly happened with the accident? And so let's jump into it. So I was at the University of Arizona, like I said, studying. I was at the rec center and I had just gotten done with a swim workout. I had my backpack with me, my Speedo backpack, and I had a bunch of stuff in there and a kickboard and all my different equipment. And I had dressed, I had finished the swim. I had dressed back into my clothing, my just gym clothes, because I was biking, commuting to campus from where I was living. And I had actually moved by this point. So my whole college time at U of A, I lived close to campus. And then I had just moved with a buddy of mine to his house, which was miles away from campus. So I was commuting. So I was in my gym clothes, waiting, heading back to my bike so that I could bike home. And I'm waiting right by the rec center. There's a traffic light and there's one really, really busy intersection that goes between that's it's called it's sixth and Highland. And it's right between the rec center and main campus. And so I'm waiting at the traffic light for to light to turn so that I could cross the street and get back to my bike and bike home. And that's the last thing I remember. But from the stories and the things that happened and the police reports and and all that witnesses and people saw. So a car jumped the curb to try to avoid hitting another car. And he ended up hitting the traffic light pole. And the traffic light pole is what ended up falling and landing on the back of my head and my neck. So, and then it pinned me to the ground and I don't know, I just blink of an eye, blink of an eye. Yeah. Don't remember of course any of it because you wouldn't, but I think it was the crosswalk box that actually really smashed me on the back of the head because the side of my head, the back, there was a lot of just damage there. And I think that if the pole, I'm not sure if the actual pole itself, people said the pole landed on me, but I'm not exactly sure what happened. All I know is that I was traumatic brain injury. And so on the scene, when paramedics arrived, I was resisting, really was combative on the scene. Did you even know what you were doing? No, I didn't. I don't remember any of this. Yeah. So combative, didn't remember anything. They took, they strapped me down to a stretcher, put me in, put me in a cervical collar, brought me to the trauma bay. I was taken care of at University Medical Center there in Tucson. And it was just so happened to be lucky enough that I was able to remember my dad's number of all numbers because I can't even remember. I barely remember my dad's number right now. Wow. All kinds of other numbers, but somehow I remember my dad's number. So the chaplain ended up giving my mom and dad a call and said, we're not sure what's going to happen with them. You better just head down here. So it was a long two hour drive for my mom and dad to come from Scottsdale to head down to Tucson to come see me at the hospital. What injuries were you sustaining at this point? Was there any internal bleeding or anything or? Yeah. So I had a midbrain bleed. And I had a lot of lacerations on my scalp, on my side. I did have a punctured, I did had a pneumothorax, which is a punctured lung. I broke a couple of ribs and then there was, they thought I had broke C7, but it actually was, 
I think it was, so they said it's either C7, T1. There was kind of some, some issue oh, between the two. So, and then there was compression fractures of T2 through T5. Oh, so unbelievable. Yeah. Pretty significant injuries. And so at university medical center, I ended up being in trauma for, well, they, so I was very lucky because one of my good friends, Adam was a anesthesia resident at the time. And so he got a call from my sister saying, Hey, Peter's showed up in trauma. Wow. He went down there. He was just getting off work. He went in there and the neurosurgical resident was just, he was doing, um, he was sewing up my forehead and they had stapled, pulled some lacerations and different things. They were full thickness on the top of my head. So it went all the way down to my scalp. And so he was sewing up my head and, and Adam had told him, you know, take care of him. He's my buddy. And so yeah. he took an extra like whatever it was, hour or two to actually do like more of a plastic surgery type of a job on my forehead. So I kind of have a Harry Potter scar, but you can't really tell mm, wow. from the injury. Emergency medicine is fascinating. It's unbelievable what they can do. And you get a lot of natural doctors out there that they're just like, it's, they're just gung ho. Like they're not for the surgical or the medicine. Everything has a place is what, pretty much what I'm trying to say. And it's amazing what that can do. And there's a place for every type of medical discipline. Yeah, there's a few crackpots out there, different people who are just really hedging everything on something or one modality or another. And every single thing out there, and I, and I believe every single drug even has its place, you know. Yeah. So, you know, I think the biggest thing is to be understanding of these other things and to be open and be inquisitive about what they have to offer. But yeah, trauma was instrumental in helping put me back together, Humpty Dumpty after that accident. And I've seen it many times having done mentorship and work with the pediatric surgeons here in, in, in the Phoenix area and spending time with them. I mean, watching them put back together gunshot wounds. I mean, the different things that they put together, it's just insane the type of work that they can do. And, and so I think everything has got its place and no place would I rather be than in our society with our current Western medical model for trauma care. Absolutely mm -hmm. nowhere else in the world. Now, Pete, how long did it take you to like black back in and come to and really assess your state and what's going on? I think it was probably like the, I start to remember things, just random things from the second and the third day. I remember more actually second day, first day and the second day. I don't remember anything really. I mean, people were saying, I was saying interesting things like, Oh, put the sweet potato in the oven at three fifty for an hour. Like I was just really? saying stuff, you know, wow. I, mean, just, wow. I mean, that's good. You know, that's good yeah, advice. Yeah. But I don't think that the nurses in the ER really <laughs> know what to do with sweet potatoes. So Funny. the third day, actually my mentor, the pediatric surgeon I was working with in the, in the Phoenix area drove down to the hospital because she heard about the accident, took her girls with her and came down there and pretty much told the staff in the hospital that he's going to be under my care. Make sure that you give me all of his records. I'm going to be taking care of him. I'm going to be referring him out to everyone that I need to take care of. He's, he's wow. my patient. So, and then she also told me, she said, now the one thing you're going to want to do is to try to take as little to no none of the pain medicine as possible. If you have to take anything, ibuprofen, something like that, but I don't want you on, you know, if you want to try to remember things, let's probably get you off of the hydrocodones and the different pain medicines that you're taking if you don't need them. So at that point was when I started to, I weaned off of taking, I didn't have to wean. I just stopped taking any of those other pain medicines and just took like 600, 800 strength ibuprofen a couple few times a day for pain. What was the language being told to you at this point? I mean, you were probably pretty freaked out as well too, right? Yeah, it was the initial scare was probably the worst for everyone. But being there, I mean, I just was thankful to be able to be in that. I just remember telling the first people that I saw that I was just thankful to be alive and then I'd be like the most grateful cripple even if I had to be wow. in the chair. Like to me, I was just thankful to be there for people. And with people, like I had cousins, my parents were there, the mentors that I had came into the room that had a, a different pediatric surgeon who was a mentor in Tucson. He came in and he was joking with me and telling me I didn't have any, I'm only 5'7". He goes, you didn't have any height to lose. He goes, you don't, you know, you're like two inches shorter now. So we were trying to keep light of it all. And I was trying yeah. to walk as much as I could. I did have a severe diplopia, so double vision, um, mm. because the pole hit me in the back of the head occipital region right there. It's where vision 
Mm -hmm. It's what generates our vision. So I did have a cranial nerve palsy. And so I was seeing double when I would look down and to the left. Wow. So that was kind of interesting. So I remember the only thing is they'd said, okay, the brain bleed stopped within 24 hours. So they didn't have to do like any intracranial pressure monitoring or anything like that. They were that, of course, we all breathed a big sigh of relief because that's where the big problems come in is if you keep bleeding in the brain. My back was really sore and walking was, it was just, I I had to learn what I could and couldn't do Mm -hmm. to bring on severe pain. And then laying down was hard because I was in this big thoracic, you know, like a thoracic and cervical combined brace. So I couldn't really move my head at all. And I was trying to move my head and they're like, don't, don't be moving your head. You can't be doing that. Yeah. Especially because you might have even had a, you had a fracture at either C7 or T1 too. They probably didn't want too much rotation going on. Exactly. Yep. Pete, did you have any like blaring headaches, brain fog, trouble concentrating, or were you pretty, sh- after like a couple of weeks, were you pretty sharp? No, I had significant trouble concentrating and focusing. Remembering anything was an absolute, just, it was the biggest challenge People came into my room and it was people that I knew even too, which was really interesting. And people would, I would ask You looked them, at them with like a blank face? Yeah. Like, and wow. I would want to say their name because so my background I've done, I enjoyed the sales. I've been in sales before too. And so for me, like remembering people's names, that's a key thing in life, just knowing mm-hmm. someone's name. So I would want to say people's names and oh my goodness, what's their name again? You know, mm. and she would have to remind me of people's names people would tell me something, they would leave, it would be just totally gone. Like I almost had to take, I wanted to take notes all over the place, but I couldn't take notes. And wow. So that was really troubling for me more than the physical aspect. And so I was transferred from on like the fourth day, I was transferred to an inpatient rehabilitation hospital in Scottsdale, Arizona by home, because I was going to go from there to home you know, all the PT stuff, we did PT stuff every day. And there was all kinds of things that we were doing, but nothing was focused on my mind. And there was no, nothing that we were doing was focusing on my memory or trying to help me with my mind. And I was like, physically, I don't care if I'm physically crippled in some way, but if I can't use my mind, like we're yeah. a mind with a body, right? Mm-hmm. So I mean, absolutely. Yeah. So am I just going to be stuck with not being able to remember things? Or I mean, what, how's this going to go? I mean, certainly can't keep doing the route that I had planned. If this is the case, really kind of stuck there. And I was, I tried not to get too hung up on it. I take naps as often as I could. I was real irritable if I got tired. And that's where my mom started telling me, like, it was like, I was a little kid again. She was like, you're getting irritable. It's time for a nap. I'm stuck. Now, so Especially with what everything, your life prior to this accident, you were going all the time. You had a lot going on. You also said there was something missing. And with this type of injury, with any brain injury or any huge setback in life like this, you spend a lot of time on your back at night staring at the ceiling, just thinking about what's going on. What was that reanalysis of analysis of life like? And like, what were you thinking about? What were you contemplating? Did you kind of try to figure out what was missing in your life? And did it steer you in a different direction? Yeah, the big thing that happened for me with all this was that, like life was taken back to very, very simple, simple structure, day to day basis, my main things that I had to focus on were sleeping, I had to eat good food, I had to do my physical activity that I need to do my which was my PT. And I needed to be around people. So relationships are real important to me. And then I wanted to be advancing myself in some way, shape, or form. I'm a big disciple of the green and growing, ripe and rotting mentality of Mm -hmm. like, you've got to be doing something every day. The big thing that became very evident to me was that I wasn't missing anything all along, is that I was really just kind of brought back to what really matters in life. And then faith was, faith really like, that was where I realized that I was ready to go at that time, but God didn't take me. So I'm here for some other purpose than what I was serving at the time. And so being home, like I said, I would sleep really good. Mom would tell me to take naps if I got irritable or whatever else. And then movement became an important thing. So I was doing my PT, but then about a couple weeks into my rehab at home, 
I just decided like I was going to start pursuing the things I used to do when I was home on the weekends with my family. I would go for walks around a local golf course. Mm. And so in my big brace, without my ability to boom my head down or up or have any cervical rotation, you know, turn my head side to side, the big thing was like, well, I'm just going to walk around the golf course. And yeah, I can't look down, but I'm just going to have to be more sure of my steps. And I'm just going to have to bend my whole body if I need to look down or do something wow. like that, bend at the waist. That's something you take for granted, not being able to see the ground where you're walking. Jeez. No kidding. That's a, so true. So I started walking and I'd walk like anywhere between six and 12 miles a day in more. Really? Yeah. I just, wow. I had my, uh, so my memory was bad, but I wanted to try to strengthen my own to see if I could get my memory back on my own. So with this determination that I had, I was listening to a podcast. I'd walk the golf course and I'd listen to it and I'd listen to it over again. I'd listen to it over again. I just like, I was trying to Mm. remember something and I was just like, just blank, just blank. I couldn't remember anything. So what are we talking here after the incident right now? Well, it was pretty static. Like things didn't really get a whole lot. Like initially after memory was so much worse and I couldn't even sustain like five minutes of journaling really. Cause it was just like, this is what I'm doing right now. This is what I want to do today. This is what I ate just now. This is what my physical activity plans are today. I want to read for five minutes. If I could sustain five minutes of reading, I was lucky because I'd like read back that same page and be like, oh, okay, I didn't remember any of that. Mm-hmm. So I'd read it over again and then I would just fall asleep because reading just made me super exhausted. So I would read in bed to put myself to sleep as well. Mm-hmm. But then as the weeks got, we had fall, it was fall. So that the accident happened on the 10th day of the 10th month of the 10th year in the Malawi. Wow. So it was 10, 10, 2010. And so with that fall doesn't cool off here till the end of October. We always say, Halloween hits and then it starts to cool off in Arizona. Mm -hmm. You you can have in the 90 degree range uh, through October. So right after I had been home for probably a couple weeks and it started to cool off. And so walking was more of a reality for me. And that's when I put in more long days. I do like 12 miles a day on that. I just, just walk and I'd eat and I'd come home and then my, I'd usually have friends over or somebody over in the evening to visit with. And uh, that really boosted my spirits too. having friends that really cared about and remembered what I was going through and were there to be able to uh, share and make new memories with me. How, was there anybody in your ear at this point that was like, listen, Pete, you might not get your memory back here and you might have to live with this forever. At this point, I was actually too scared to talk about it. Uh, mm. I really wasn't talking. I was the same way. Yeah. I mean, it was like, there's no way. Like, I'm just going to stay quiet about this. If people find out that this is what I'm like right now, I mean, this is like huge vulnerability. And from where I was publishing papers and a straight A pre-med student and this and that, I was like, well, I'm just going to keep quiet and hope that my memory comes back. Wow. um, Because I don't want this to be a a severe disability going forward. So people were like, oh, you look great. Things look great. Like, it looks like your recovery is going awesome. And inside I'm like, yeah, but. And so that was the thing. At one point, I was probably a few months into my recovery process and I went in to start helping and looking at data for the pediatric surgeons I was working with. I was the research fellow. And so I went in and they were paying me to analyze data and to take it in and to put it into spreadsheets. And so I went in and, oh, actually, no, it was before that. So sorry, that was later. But I went in and she, my mentor was the one who was, remember, she was the one who was going to take over my care, right? So mm-hmm. I with her in the office and uh, she's, we're visiting and I'm trying to laugh and keep light of things and whatever. And, and she says, Pete, just to make, she goes, it looks like everything's going great, but just to make sure that everything is good for you. And you're just like, you've got this highway to medical school, like you've had before. Everything looks like it's on par pretty much. Let's just get a neuropsychological evaluation just to make sure everything's good. Mm-hmm. And the way she said it was so sweet. I just was like, I was on board. If it would have been mm-hmm. any less gentle of a suggestion, it would have probably (laughs) the wrong way, but she said it so nicely that I was like, okay. So I saw a neuropsychologist here in the Valley and it was the hardest thing I had done in the longest time. I could, I couldn't remember anything that I'd ever done that was harder. They put like different shapes in front of you and everything. And they try to like, they, all the different neurological cognitive tests. It's probably, it's draining for, especially someone that's had a brain injury. Totally. And I was probably about five to six months out at this point. I was maybe four. 
I have all the medical records, but either way, it's probably about three to four months out. And I was doing this testing. Yeah, they test every part of your brain. I mean, they look to see where there's correlation. So everything kind of correlates with your brain function to a certain degree, like they can draw and they can deduce what's going wrong based on the correlatives of all the different areas of brain function. And so like your IQ and all these other things, they kind of stack them and they just line them up side by side and they go, okay, this is good. This is good. This is for you. Like these are all lined up. It's not either good or bad. It just, it is what it is, but it's like, here's all your numbers, but this one is way off. Mm. And so that's the one for me was working memory. And that's like working memories, like everything you do in school, it's everything you do in life. It's like you interpret what comes at you and you make sense of it and you utilize that information in a new way. So that was really something that I went home from that test. I told my mom, I said, I definitely failed that test. Whatever that was. Whatever that was. (laughs) Whatever whatever, that means, I didn't do well. Exactly. Whatever it was, I just did terrible. (laughs) And it was so depressing because I was like, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially from being a straight A student and just mastering all tests that came your way before that, that had to be a pretty big letdown for you. It was a super letdown. And so I'm thinking to myself, great, now what? And so when I went back to see her, she said, well, we're going to send you back. We're going to send you to speech therapy. Speech therapy will work on these different areas of the brain. That's what they do to help you recover. They don't just work with stroke victims or people who can't, you know, who have a, a lisp or who stutter or whatever. They work with people's brains. And so the neuropsychological evaluation gave the uh, pointers as to what we needed to work on. So I started seeing a speech therapist when I got back to school. So what ended up happening is the accident happened in October and I went back to school in January. With the That's new- fast. It was really fast. And it was honestly, it was probably a little soon. I know it was a little soon because my memory, even at school, like the speech therapist I was working with, I told her, I was like, my, I'm like so distracted. And she's yeah. like, well, you have to take everything in your room and put it in boxes and put it in the garage. Everything. Wow. She's like, you just need your bed. You need your desk with a lamp on it. You need one dictionary. So she just kind of told me like what I needed to do. And it wow. helped significantly. Yeah. So took away the distractions. I dropped my course load from like 18 credits down to like 12, just to like, mm-hmm. just to bare bones, like stay full time, barely full time at 12 units, yeah. but drop that down. And um, what I found, I was significantly surprised at what I found was the mechanism for me to remember things, which was audio. So I would. That was the best way for you to remember things. Yeah. Oh Yeah. So I would start to like use an audio recorder and I would speak my outlines and my notes for like biochemistry class and whatever into that. And then I would, then I started to, that was how I could retain things. So I needed to speak it. Was that the same as before the injury? Was that the best way you learned or were you more of a visual learner before the injury? I don't know if I ever really even took it into account. I love, I'm very auditory. Like I love listening to things. So Mm -hmm. I think I've always loved that, but I really realized that, okay, this is a strength I have. I need to start utilizing this. So right, that's smart. Yeah. I mean, I was just like, what am I going to do? You know, and the speech therapist said, Hey, you're going to compensate a lot, but we really need to focus on those areas in which are really lacking and not just pretend that everything's a okay. We need to like really find and just dig deep on these areas that are suffering. So that was the work that we did like a couple times a week. It was really intense work. I'd get home from those speech therapy sessions and they were on like my off days from school. I'd have to take a nap almost when I got home because it was just, it was exhausting. Pete, what do you think, just listening to your story, it sounds like you're always trying to find a way to overcome the obstacle where you've hit so many roadblocks. I think a lot of people have been like, you know what? I'm done. I'm just going to wait it out. I'm not going to do anything. Maybe it will get better. Maybe you weren't. You were just constantly trying to figure out how to get better. What do you think that is? Well, I had people that believed in me for sure. And I believed in myself. I mean, one of the things that really changed my life so dramatically was the summer after high school. So in the end of high school, the last couple of years of high school, I struggled with uh, substance induced eating disorder. Mm-hmm. So I was abusing ephedra mm-hmm. and I was taking it three times a day and it like took away my appetite and I became anorexic. I went probably from like 160 pounds down to like 128 pounds. Mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm not a tall guy, but that was like, I mean, I was dinky, like I was so small. And so 
I really struggle with depression. I mean, I was stimulating myself all day long. So if you're just stimulated all the time, well, there was the time for repletion, right? Mm-hmm. So I'd wake up at five, I'd pop a Fedra, I'd go back to bed for half an hour and I'd wake up just lit up for all day long. Mm. And I would just keep using that. So I really struggled with depression in the end of high school. And I, it was a really just kind of a sad time for me. But I guess what I did during that time was there was some reason I took and, and grabbed onto one of these things my cousin did in one of his summers my cousin named Grant in uh, Minnesota had been, I had heard that Grant had been doing a sales job all summer long and he was selling books to help out with kids schoolwork door to door. And I was like, that sounds sweet. Grant's an amazing person. I want to be more like him. Sign me up. Mm -hmm. And and no idea what it was going to entail except for that. It was probably going to be hard, but I was going, I was game to do it. So that summer, right after I graduated, I left the next morning for Nashville, Tennessee to the Southwestern company's headquarters. And we did sales training for a whole week. And that was like, I mean, boots, just boots on the ground, sales training for door to door sales. And that was like the most positive, optimistic, and just like life altering environment I'd ever been in. And then taking that from sales training to head out to the book field, like which is the town essentially where I was going to be selling in. My cousin had already knocked on doors and found a place to live. And that's how we find a place to live. You'd knock on doors and you got a, you know, a certain thing that you ask people for and just see if they know of anybody who has a place that they would rent out or something like that to a couple of college students that they're not going to see much, but that are going to be selling for 85, 90 hours a week. And so that summer was what changed my life. I mean, there's nothing like hard work, boots on the ground for 85 hours a week. Door to door. Door to door. Yep. That is wild. Yeah, it was wild. Knocked on over 4,000 doors and huh? sold and so many books. Wh- what role did uh, that play in the depression? So it kicked it. It was almost immediate. That it was, was crazy how that, yeah, like sales training. I don't even remember what happened. I just remember that I was focused on something else, not myself, not mm-hmm. my body image, not this or that, but I was, everyone who I was around was just a positive person. Wow. Yeah. In the sales environment, I was like, this is crazy. Like these people are like liquid sunshine. This is who I need to be around. This is what, and it disappeared almost immediately. Now that, So that summer was the catalyst for me really becoming a different person. And so I've kind of carried... It sounds like it rewired your brain and really helped you with the brain trauma. Yeah. So... Unbelievable. Yep. It gave me that. And so having that in my background, I was like, hey, I'm capable of anything. If I can knock on doors all summer and sell to people who I don't even know, then I can recover from... I can do anything. Mm -hmm. There was a quote by a guy named Roger Seip. He was, it was one of my sales training CDs and he had said, if you can do this, you can do anything. And I thought to myself that had always coursed through ever since then. I mean, maybe it was a little bit of a air of confidence I carried with me too. always knowing that I could do whatever I wanted since I was able to do that. Wow. Yeah. So that was really powerful. Powerful stuff. That would explain why you were just kept searching for ways to get better. So you finally found the audio and that was helping your memory, stimulate your memory and retain things. Where did you go from there? So one thing I forgot to mention is before I got back to university, I had, so there had been a TV crew that had kind of probably documented the accident and they reached out to me. You had video footage? Not of the accident. They documented the trauma after in the scene and whatever else. And so they contacted me and said, hey, how are you doing now? You know, we'd like to get in touch with you. We were there. And so they actually reached out and I said, yeah, come on over. It'd be great. You know, great to have you guys over and you can see what's going on. And they came over and they were like videoing me walking and asking me what's going on. And, oh, it looks like you're doing great. Like mm. what's next? You know, they're always looking for like that. What's the yeah. big story? You know, like what's the next <laughs> thing you're going to do, right? It was something, yeah. Yeah, something. Like, so they asked me what I was going to do. And my mom kind of reminded me, she said, hey, you've been talking about wanting to do this cross-country bike trip for a long time. Oh, yes. I forgot about this. Yeah. So I said it in front of the TV camera. I said, so they said, so what's next? And so I look over at my mom and I look at the camera and I was like, I'm going to bike across the country. No so way. I it to it in front of the camera and I was like, dang, now I got to do huge. it. That's huge. That held you accountable right there probably. It held me accountable. Yeah. So I got back to school then in the spring and this whole time I was going to speech therapy. I bike to speech therapy. The way I utilize my audio in a you know, recognition and my memory with that is I would go on these like 80 mile long distance rides to just kind of build my stamina. And I would be listening to my notes while I was biking. So I'd get back and I like, I'd like ace my biochem exams. Cause it was like my, this is after the incident. 
Yeah, this was after. So this was when I was starting to bike. This is so back in university. So back in the spring and I was starting to bike and I was still going to speech therapy and I was using my audio recorder to listen to my notes as I was on my bike rides. Wow, that's wild because I remember when I was able to start functioning again in exercise, like I would tell people, oh, I'm going to go surfing. I'm going to do all this stuff. And they're like, are you nuts? You just had a brain injury. If you get the slightest bit hit again, you could be done. Aren't you scared? And was anybody in your ear like you're going to ride a bike on the road? You can easily get hit and have another brain injury. Was that, did that come up at all? It came up with the orthopedic surgeon. He was a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. So I saw all pediatric specialists after my injury because my mentor is a pediatric surgeon. So all yeah. of her referral partners were for were pediatric guys. So I got lollipops and stickers and everyone saw <laughs> an orthopedic surgeon. And he looked at my x-rays and this and that. And he said, well, you're probably going to get arthritis in this area before other people and this and that. And it looks like things are okay and they're healing fine. And you know, you can take your brace off. And so number of weeks and whatever, and this was in the winter time. And one thing he had heard that I committed to this uh, cross country. <laughs> yeah, I think, and I, I think I brought it up or something like that. I can't remember, but they were definitely worried. And there, the attorneys that were involved in the case, just they were managing my insurance claims and all that stuff for me. They were like, what are you thinking? Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. So I yeah. definitely got looks yeah. and, and comments from people like, you should not be riding a bike. Like if you rack that, if you rack that brain one more time, like you're done. But that was probably something you needed. Like you probably needed to get back on the bike and just to, at least that's what it was like for me. I needed to do the things I used to be able to do for me to be able to say I'm healed. Exactly. Yeah. It was therapy, man. It was like my meditation. Just like you don't have to use your brain when you're on a bike and you're just pedaling, right? Or when you're surfing or doing whatever. I mean, you're not like being all cognitive about it. You're just in the moment. You're just doing whatever it is and you're just acting. And so that was really therapeutic. And I think it opened up space for me to actually think and to be able to process things too. Because when you're sitting in the bike for six hours at a time, just going on a long distance ride in the desert, like, what do you do? You think, or you listen to something. Mm. So if I wasn't listening to my notes, I would be able to think and process things and solve all kinds of problems on the, on my bike seat. So unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. It was great. A cross country road trip in a car can be like revolutionary. It's got to be surreal on a bike, just open road, air hitting you, just going. How was that? The cross country bike trip, but trip was something that I really just kind of dreamed up in the moment in front of that TV camera. <laughs> on the spot, completely. <laughs> just totally on the spot, man. The it was just like, it. I'm like, way to be spontaneous, man. I just, which is like, the acts of my life after the traumatic brain injury was like, I was, my spontaneity went like through the roof. Right. So yeah. And also being direct. So there's a couple things. Oh, anyway. So I just decided that, okay, I'm going to do the Northern tier, the Northern tier. So since I don't like to do anything that's easy, let's take the longest route across the country. So from Washington to Maine, Washington state, the coast over to Bar Harbor, Maine was the longest route ended up being around 4,400 miles all said and done. One but, month. So I started at the, in the third week of May on the coast of Washington. And for those of you who know Washington, it's not very warm in May. No, not at all. And so I came from Arizona where in May, I mean, we're already hitting 100. So I was training yeah. with 100 degrees, warm. I was just sweating like crazy. You know, I was wearing as minimal amount of gear as I could and learned to pack the bike super light. I only had two pairs of on the bike clothes, two pairs of off the bike clothes, minimal necessities to get going. I didn't even bring a stove with me. I was like, you know, I'm and in training in a hot place. You're like, I don't care about hot food. All I want is cold stuff. Well, you go to a cold environment. It's kind of like, okay, I could probably use something hot right now. But and what was your plan? Were you going to stop in like motels and hotels? Were you going to camp? What was going on with that? So before I left, when I got back to school in the spring, I just started planning. I bought the maps. The American Cycling Association has these pre kind of planned out maps for all these big routes. So I got them. I just started planning, okay, I'm roughly going to bike this many miles a day. You know, I'm just between 70 and 90, kind of start picking places where I'm just going to stop and just start planning a route to just kind of have a ballpark idea for what I was going to do. So I just decided to camp. Um, I had a- Solo. 
This is solo trip? Solo trip. Yep. By myself. What? Yeah. So by myself. After a brain injury. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. So mom was a little worried. You know, a lot of people. (laughs) So that was the case. So yeah, I planned this thing. I was like, I'm going to do this solo. And uh, I wrote for a charity, the Children's Heart Foundation, because I was trying to, at the same time, when you're biking, you don't look like such a bum if you're biking for charity. So, and you're like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> I did decide to stay clean shaven and all that. So I planned out my route to kind of go like 80, 90 miles a day and started on the coast of Washington. And I wanted to be in Marquette, Michigan, which is in the UP of Michigan, Upper Peninsula. I wanted to be there by 4th of July weekend because there was some summer annual church services that were going to be held in Marquette. So I was like, well, it'd be cool. I'll be on the trip, stop there. And then another thing I wanted to do was stay with my great grandmother who was still alive at the time in Canada. So I was like, well, I'll bike up into Canada, come back in through New York, and then just finish up that way. So, I mean, man, I could go in so many ways at the bike trip because there was so many things I learned. Take your time with this because this is fascinating to me. Like this would definitely be a bucket list thing for me because, uh, I, I I just love, I've been cross country in a car three times and that's been amazing. I can't imagine what it's like on a bike. Well, you just slow everything down by hours and hours and hours and days. Hours, and days. yeah. I mean, just to kind of highlight it real quick, I got to North Dakota and I was about to leave from my cousin's place. I stayed with her over the night and my cousins from Washington had driven there. The They left the previous night. And I had been on the road for weeks and weeks. And you know what I mean? They got there and it was like depressing kind of. I was like, well, oh, I was like, God. like it gave me a new, That's such a slap in the such face. Such a slap in the face, man. <laughs> I was like, gee whiz, like really? Like that, going across the country, I mean, you see so much that you didn't really ever see before. I mean, you, you nothing just goes by in a blur. Like you get a look at the same t- sign, you know, three or four times. Or you mm. see stuff on the sides of the roads. I mean, I probably could have started a bungee cord company with all the bungee cords that were all over the sides of the roads and stuff that you just see that you don't really don't see. So, but people were amazing. I think the biggest takeaways from the bike trip were like, people were so friendly. And I mean, I would just get into a conversation with someone. I'd be like, Hey, you know, I'm looking for a place to pitch my tent for the night. I'm going to be camping. They'd be like, you know what? Just come to our house. Just, you can pitch your tent at our place. And then you get to visiting with them wow. at their house and they're like, you don't need to stay in outside. Come in the house. Yeah. You know, what are you doing? They feel you out first and they realize you're a good guy and then they, and they invite totally. you. Totally. Yep. So that happened a lot and that was really fun. They, so where were you meeting these people at? Like rest stops and just yeah, anywhere? Grocery really? stores. I mean, so my basic plan was to keep it simple and just to stop at grocery stores on a daily basis instead of buying and getting fast food or doing any of that stuff. So my goal was to load up each day. So I had enough stuff for the entire day and then just kind of make it through the day. How much water did you have on you? I only had four four water bottles. And I think the longest I ever went between places typically would be between most, usually it'd be between 20, between 15 and 30 miles would be another stop, which isn't that long. I think of US now as like one big strip mall. I mean, really like there yeah. isn't a place that you can't go or you can't get what you need. And I realized quickly on the bike trip, I had when I had too much stuff and I'd pick, accumulate stuff, I'd just send it home in a UPS box. And mm-hmm. so that way I kept myself light. But I'd stop at grocery stores, get all my food stuffs for the day. And I had a handlebar bag and I'd kind of put some food in there. And But yeah, I kept my sleeping bag, my tent, my sleeping pad, two pairs of on the bike clothes, two pairs of off the bike clothes, just a simple lock. And the lock wasn't even for securing the bike, really. I mean, it was more like just to hook it to my zipper to my tent at night. So if someone tried to steal it and run away with it, they would pull the whole tent and it would alert me and then whatever I could. Mm-hmm. So I never had to worry about it though. I actually stopped locking the bike pretty soon into the trip because it was, I felt like it was totally pointless. People were so friendly. I mean, I left my bike outside grocery stores all the time. No one took anything. I did have a iPad too, so I could blog the trip and I blogged it mm-hmm. in the, that was a lot of fun. So I'd stop maybe every three, four days and I'd do a blog post on what I was up to and share some pictures. What roads did you choose? Did you have to avoid some of the major highways and go like more of a scenic route or? So the ACA is pretty good about that with their bike maps and they kind of take you like where it's bike friendly. And so US mm-hmm. to highway two across the country on the Northern part of the country is relatively remote. I mean, it's a highway, but like it's, it's only a two lane, sometimes four lane, but it's just two lane. And it was mm-hmm. pretty basic. I mean, pretty rural back roads. I mean, so like 
starting off in Washington, kind of found my way to where I needed to go. I really, there was some of the ways I actually had to deviate. I'm, originally, I was planning to take the old Cascades Highway in northern Washington, and there was 20 feet of snow on the pass. I couldn't even actually. Wow. So I, I planned it for summer, but to them, that's not summer. It's not summer till the yeah. 4th of July in Washington. So mm-hmm. I had to deviate right wow. away. And the way that I went, got so I went from Washington, went, and then I kind of deviated and went my way back up, made my way back to the route, and then went through Idaho, stayed with some friends there, some mutual friends, the mayor and his wife in Sandpoint, Idaho. That was really fun. What? That was cool. They treated me like a king. And I'd actually had a partially ruptured a tendon in Washington. It was so cold in my left foot, I couldn't really feel. So here I had trained in Arizona, right? Nice and warm out and got to Washington. I could barely feel my legs. It was so cold and so wet on some of these passes that I, I couldn't feel my left. I was just kind of keep, my legs were just going through the motions. Like I couldn't really mm-hmm. feel too much. And one particular day I was climbing up this mountain pass and I just, and I was just straining. I mean, what they call grinding, you know, like uh, just mashing on the pedals. And I heard a pop and I didn't really feel much. I was pretty numb still because I really couldn't feel my lower legs, but I was like, that was bad. I don't know what it was, but that's not good to hear a pop like that because that wasn't from my bike. That was from me. Ah, man. So pulled into this first little off the uh, resort that was off the way and kind of licked my wounds and assessed it. And I was like, oh boy, this is pretty bad. So I limped into a hotel that night, ice packed it up. And I was like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to call and figure, I'm going to call some PT somewhere. I'm going to figure something out. I'm just going to figure out how to do this. So I got into Sandpoint, Idaho, kind of on a song and a dance and just a hope. And I called a friend of mine who is a physical therapist in Minnesota. And she said, well, ideally you should stop and rest it and you should ultrasound and you should do all kinds of stuff to kind of rehab that thing back up and assess the situation. And I was like, hey, the chances that I'm going to stop now are are slim to none. There's no chance that I'm stopping. So what do I need to do to keep going? She's like, well, see if the PT in the town, you know, see what they could do, you know, see if you can get in with someone. And otherwise you can take ibuprofen. It's going to slow down the healing process and the remodeling, and there's going to be some detrimental effects of it, but you can take ibuprofen. (laughs) (laughs) There is going to be some lifelong effects, but yeah, right. So go for it. You know? So I'm like, okay, well, so I started on, I went to the first little grocery store I found, got some ibuprofen and, and, um, wanted to use as little as possible, but and then I had an ice pack that I strapped around my legs. So some days you'd see me biking with this blue thing on my right ankle. But I did meet a PT in the town who taught me how to, he came in on a Sunday. I mean, the guy, see, this is the, the spirit of people that I met on this bike trip. He came in on a Sunday, was totally not, he wasn't even in the mm-hmm. office for a couple more days. He's like, oh, I'll come in. He didn't even know you, right? He didn't know me from Adam. No. Ooh, didn't know. What a so, guy. Yeah, the mayor knew him. He wasn't the mayor at the time. He had been the mayor. And so mm-hmm. he was retired from his public service, but he was, he knew this guy. He's like, Oh, he's a great PT. I'll just give you his number. Just text him and see when his availability is. If you need to stay in the town a few days, when we can host you, keep you with us. And so they were feeding me good food and all that. But I got a hold of this guy, this PT, and he came in on his day off, all that taught me how to, he ultrasounded my, that tendon. It ended up being my flexor hallucis longus, which is that tendon that goes to my big toe on my left foot. And it helps it flex down. And so he came in, he was ultrasounding that. And then he taught me how to kinesio tape it so that I could do something on a daily basis that would be not medically related, not having to take medicines to help it. So I did a tape job on that every day. And from there on, I mean, that was the one thing that was really like a big, big, I mean, it was a glaring setback immediately, but I was like, Hey, well, whatever, like this isn't stopping me. So with them, I think it's a big mindset thing. Like I could have easily said, like you're saying, like I could have just said, well, that was enough. Sorry, yeah. time to pack it in. It wasn't meant to be. But I was like, no, like I have already told everyone I'm doing this. I'm committed to doing this. I'm going to figure out a way to get to the other side of the country. Yeah, I yeah. just started this trip with this. Now I got this ruptured tendon, but oh, well, let's just figure it out. Unbelievable. So that was that. From there, it was the rest is history. I mean, I made it through. Idaho in a breeze because I just was on the panhandle of Idaho. And then Montana was forever. I stayed with some friends in Whitefish, Montana. That must have been beautiful, riding a bike through beautiful. Montana. Oh, so lovely. The western side of Montana is real pretty. It's mountainous, you know, Glacier National Park. So I biked around Glacier on US 2. I would have went through it. I was right on the border, which is the, the highway is the border of it. But I couldn't go through it because going to the Sun Road was closed because they had too much snow. And that was the original route that I planned. But 
it's okay. So I went around that. And then on the eastern side of Montana, it was just like prairies and prairies and prairies. Just like I didn't really realize that Montana was so flat. And because a lot of this, as you can tell, I mean, I just jumped into it. I didn't do all my research just to figure out what was what and where. Best way to do it. Like, yeah, just kind of go for it, right? (laughs) Yeah. Eastern Montana was like just, man, I had a headwind. That year was really rainy. There was lots of flooding and the headwinds were brutal. I mean, one day I think I made it, I was going just... I was going about, I mean, made 70 miles in seven hours. It took me forever. I mean, I was like barely moving. Oh my God. I felt like I could have walked that fast, but I was like, I'm not getting off this bike. You know, I'm just going to keep going. You know? <laughs> wow. So made it across Montana and into North Dakota. Oh, and, Mon- and North Dakota was good. I had a really, really solid day where the wind was kind of at my back. If I turned a certain way, I was like, okay, I'm looking at the map because if I can turn that way, the wind will be at my back and I could really make a solid day. So there was a route that actually cut from Northwest to Southeast. And so I jumped on this route and I made like, I had the wind probably like Ooh, 15, 20 mile feeling. per hour wind behind my back. Oh, and I made yeah. like 140 miles that day and like wow. no time whatsoever, you know, just flew. And that was my longest day and then made it into Fargo where I stayed with a cousin and then into Minnesota where I stayed with friends and really met a super inspiring young girl. I had known about her before my trip started, but she, her name was Olive and she was born with a brain tumor and they ended up operating on the tumor. And because of that, she's partially blind or she is blind. She uses a, a like a walking stick and she has a braille typewriter. And I stayed with them at their, her grandparents' home. And this girl was like, I mean, for kids like her, like, I mean, I would have given everything. Like she's just, it was just incredible. She was so inspiring to me. Like she was exactly what I I was trying to do, which was not stop at anything. And she was busy doing that. I mean, she's to this day, she's a happy, healthy young girl. She's still got some sequelae or things that some results from that operation she had, but she's tumor free and they monitor her and she's just, she doesn't stop at anything. So I met her in Minnesota and her stayed with her family there. And then I made it through, I stayed with some friends in Duluth, and then I went over to Wisconsin. And then in Wisconsin, I sailed on a sailboat for the first time. I learned how to sail. Really? Yeah. So on my way over there, I was like, okay, I'm going to learn how to sail. I'm st- I'm just biking by these great lakes. I'm just like, this is great. This is so neat. Yeah. So I got into this little town of Ashland, Wisconsin, and I was hanging out by the docks and some guy comes over. He's like, hey, it looks like you're on a bike trip. So we started visiting and and then he goes, Hey, I'm just about to go on a go sail for sunset. He goes, You wanna you wanna come sailing with me? Learn oh, how to wow. sail? I was like, just so, like that. Just like that. Just the power of intention, right? Yeah. You know, I'm huge. just setting that. It's so huge. So then from there into Michigan and in Michigan stayed with friends in the Copper Country, the upper peninsula. And then there was the annual church services were there. I stayed for about five days in Blanken on the town right now. Stayed up in oh Marquette, Michigan. So I stayed in Marquette for five days, and then from Marquette I left and went over the bridge into Canada and biked to my great grandma's house and stayed with her for about four or five days. And that was just amazing to be able to be with her. This was not the last time, but the second to the last time. And we picked blueberries together, and I mowed her lawn, and we visited. She speaks Finnish, and so I had learned some Finnish having been in Finland before, and so we were just we would communicate in Finn and she would speak simple English and she was like 94 and still going strong. So it was pretty cool to be with her. And then I had a buddy of mine who reached out to me and said, Hey, you know, one of my closest buddies and said, Hey, I'd love to bike with you for some of this trip. Like, is there any way that I could join you? And I said, yeah, sure. I'm going to be in New York next. If you want to come fly out here and bring your bike, like let's finish it. Was he he in Arizona too? Yep. And so he ended up flying to Albany and uh, ended up having to bike up to meet me. And so we met in Ticonderoga, New York, Mm -hmm. and we biked all the way from Ticonderoga. We stayed the night. This is super cool. And so this is the spirit of the people again, right? So I'm going to tell a quick story. We're in Ticonderoga and Ryan had just met up with me and we'd, I had done my laundry and we'd eaten and whatever, and we're relaxing for the evening. We get to this park and this park and like, there's this beautiful park and had this wonderful waterfall and, and all this. And it said like, no loitering in the park and this and that, you know, you can't just stay there, no camping and whatnot. And so I'm like, oh, it's getting late. You know, let's just camp in the park anyways. Yeah. And it's getting late. I'm like, we'll just be out of here in the morning before anybody even sees us. So we're setting up our tents and stuff and it's dark out, right? You got to 
and a four wheeler rolls up and there's a cop on it. He's uh. like, what do you boys think you're up to? And I'm like, Oh, I'm like, sir. I'm like, so this is what I'm doing. I'm biking across the country. I'm raising money for the children's heart foundation. I just kind of gave him this thing and I yeah, said, yeah. Hey, we're just looking for a place <laughs> yeah. to crash just for the night. Yeah. And so he's like, Hey, you know what? He's like, I won't let anybody bother you here tonight. He goes, you sleep here. I'll make sure no one comes near you guys. Really? So it was just like, he just, so this was just what happened on the trip is like, all you had to do is let people know what you were about and just say it. And uh, whether people agreed or didn't, whatever. I mean, everyone was just super accommodating. Yeah. So, so Ryan and I biked from New York. We went through Vermont, which was, we coined the term elegantly backwoods because it was just so beautiful. Mm-hmm. I had never experienced anything like Vermont. Although upstate New York, the Adirondack Mountains were Adirondacks the most, are beautiful. Yeah, probably the most beautiful place on that. So Adirondacks first, then Vermont. New Hampshire was absolutely gorgeous. And then getting into Maine, I mean, it was just like, it was quick with Ryan. It was like seven days and we were done. It was just... Did you go faster with with a buddy? Yeah, he was really pushing me. And I was just like, man, I just like, I wanted to just slow down and take it all in. So finally I did tell him. Well, he was also rested. (laughs) He was totally rested. (laughs) I said, hey, you got to get behind me. Let me set the pace here. My cruising speed was probably like 14 miles an hour. Like it's not super quick. Yeah. But I'm visiting with people. I'm stopping at roadside stands, buying green beans, eating them right there, you know, stopping with a farmer, buying some strawberries on the side of the road. I mean, I'm in no hurry to get anywhere quick. Right. I'm like, I got all summer to do this. Yeah. So Ryan pushed me. And one day we were going like, we did like over a hundred miles and we were flying. And I was like, I told him at the end of that day, I said, dude, that was way too fast today. And you need to get behind me because I think we're going to, I'm going to burn out if if yeah. we're pushing this hard. I was still taking a little bit of ibuprofen, you know, at that yeah, point absolutely. still. So recovery was impaired because of that. So, mm-hmm. but overall we, and then we stayed, uh, it's at the very end of the trip in Maine, actually a couple that I had met, they were in their, probably in their sixties. They in their fifties had went for a, maybe it was their 25th wedding anniversary. They biked across the country. They were in their fifties when they did what? it. Yeah. So it's in the cards for you, brother. Oh, I'm telling you. All right. So they were in the very beginning of my bike trip on the islands off Washington that I biked and they were at one of the islands and they said, Oh, what are you doing? It looks like you're going on a bike trip. I was like, yeah, I'm going to Maine. They were like, Oh, we live in Maine. So when you get to Maine, give us a call. We'll host you. Wow. So I got to the other coast <laughs> and gave them a call and they were like, Oh, we were wondering when you were coming. They, they were like, Oh, we thought you'd been through already a while ago. You know, it's just yeah. like, so <laughs> stayed with them. And that was a good finale. I remember just sharing stories all evening with them and another couple that they had biked together with. And they went from B&B to B&B. So like they didn't have tents and sleeping bags and all that. So you could really do it in a different way. But yeah, yeah, we finished in Bar Harbor and it was actually the last day was kind of depressing. Really? When you get to something that you worked so hard for and time's almost up, it's like the culmination of all that work just for this, like Mm. just to roll down to the water and put my bikes, my bike tires in the water, like that's it. Yeah. Like I said, now I've done it. Yeah. Is that it really? That's wild. So there was probably definitely a sense of accomplishment though. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I was really high on the accomplishment and the fact that I could probably do anything I really set my mind to. So I was kind of thinking like, well, what would I want to do next? So I bought books. on like sailing around the world and mm. you know, I kind of had this adventure bug and I was like, I, I'm not really ready to just go back and finish school right at this moment, but I knew that was what I had to do. I mean, it's kind of depressing to go back to school after doing something that exciting all summer. Right. You know what I mean? What did that trip play in the healing process for you? So I, my double vision, which I was going to have to have surgery for before I left, that ended up healing. What? Don, huh? Yeah. And he was trying to talk me into it before I left. He's like, oh, you know, you're going to have this double vision and whatever on the bike trip. And you should probably get this operation done. And you haven't healed by this, probably not going to heal stats say that. And I was like, well, I'm going to heal it. So left on the bike trip because I had said in my mind, I was saying, well, I'll heal it. But to him, I said, well, I could do the bike trip, right? And he's like, yeah, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't hurt, but I don't think you're going to recover, get much recovery. And so I attribute that to the good food, the good visits and all that circulation. I mean, all that good oxygen and movement. I think that it was just really positive for everything. So In the recovery process, I could say it was instrumental in my recovery. That's awesome. That is so amazing. What are you up to now? What are you doing? Who do you like to see in practice? What's going on now? 
Yeah. So now I, so I came back from that trip and I took a change in plans. I lived a pretty holistic life and didn't know anything about naturopathic medicine, but I had heard about integrative medicine. So I found some doctors down the way that practice integrative medicine. And so I spent some time with them and I had spent all these hundreds of hours with the surgeons. And I realized after two visits with the naturopathic doctor that he did everything that I wanted to do. He talked about nutrition. He talked about lifestyle. He talked about movement. He talked about their herbs and supplements. He talked about medications and could adjust their medications as needed. He could give them IVs. He could do a physical manipulation if he wanted. I mean, I was like, who does this? And so to me, that was just mind altering. I was like, that's cool. He spends 60 to 90 minutes with a client and he gets results. Like, I really like this, you know, help people change their lives. So that in an instant, I decided in my impulsivity that I wanted to go become a naturopathic doctor and so I could practice integrative medicine and so, and naturopathic medicine. So I went back to school, I went to school, I applied to Bastyr University, which is in Seattle. And after I graduated from school, I flew up to Washington and just got going with that. And so, and through that, things that I've done along the way where my focus is, is on lifestyle medicine. So it's on the diet, it's on mindset, it's on growth in life, it's on relationships, it's on stress management, it's on nutritional optimization, it's on just being the best of who you want to be. I mean, that's really my focus with people is like, I want to create a flourishing you. I don't care I don't have any specific goals for you other than the goals that we work on together and the things that you kind of line up for me. So, and being a good referral partner is an important thing to me. So I know the best physical therapists in Scottsdale and in in Arizona. I know amazing chiropractors that are both upper cervical and that do general chiropractic work. Shout out to Ben Benuis, Dr. Ben. Yeah, Dr. Ben does network. I love love what Ben does too. So Ben connected us. And whether, it doesn't matter whether it's in conventional medicine or natural medicine or chiropractic work or physical therapy or whatever. I just want to be a good hub in the community for people to come when they've got something wrong and they know that I'll be able to connect them with the resources that they need if I can't provide them right here. So conditions I work with, I work a lot with autoimmune disease, things like ulcerative colitis, lupus, you know, Sjogren's mixed connective tissue disease, Hashimoto's, things like those are just some of the common ones that I see, Crohn's disease. Digestive problems are pretty common in practice and I love working with them because influencing and and I treat autoimmune disease like if we fix the gut, a lot of things yeah. are going to a lot of things are going to fix. Mm-hmm. So take care of people that way and then type 2 diabetes is a slam dunk. I love working with yes. people. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome, right? You get yeah. people off their insulin in a few days. Unbelievable. It's awesome to work with. So I love those kind of things. And right now I'm making waves with the new uh, podcast I got started. Yes. Please talk about Happy to have you as guest number two on the podcast. Yeah, it was an honor to be part of it. When is that coming out? It will be out on the 1st of July. 1st of July. Beautiful. So tune in the Rise Again podcast. It's got a big phoenix that's sprouting from the ashes. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the story of all of our lives, right? Yeah. people whose miraculous stories you've got on your podcast. Rise again, baby. Rise again. That's right. Absolutely. So that's what I'm doing. I'm loving life, working in private practice. My wife and I are, we have not been able to have our own children. And so having been through this process for a little while, we've actually decided that we are going to foster and then through that process, hopefully adopt. Nice. And no limit to the number right now. We both grew up in big families. I'm the oldest of eight. She's the second youngest of 12. So wow. Yeah, for us, I mean, it wouldn't be out of the realm to expect us adopting eight kids or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So just going to give it a go, man. Give it going, yeah. Yep. yep. Unbelievable. So, yeah, we're excited about life and what it has to offer. And I'm excited to be back home. And so, yeah, it's, life is good. Pete, are you ever on the East Coast at all in the New York area? One of my mentors is in uh, Flemington, New Jersey. If you come out to see him, please come see me. I would love to get you under some upper cervical care, get you adjusted. I think you'd do really well. Oh, that'd be awesome. No, yeah. I'd absolutely love it. I think there'd probably be something there for me with that. Absolutely, I mean, especially yeah. all I've been through too. Yeah, you know, it's absolutely. Cool. What well, if it's the missing link, right? Ah, it could be. Yeah, you never hey, know. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> Pete, where can people find you online, uh, social media, websites, personal practice, all that stuff? My practice is LifeDoc, all one word, L-I-F-E-D-O-C. 
all of my social media and my website's all going to be around that. So my website is lifedocaz.com. Social media, I'm on Facebook at lifedocaz and Instagram lifedoc. So that's where people can find out what I'm up to. They can start tracking the podcast episodes are going to start coming out. I'll be sharing those on Instagram and Facebook as well. And you be able to subscribe and do all that stuff and, and hear all these cool stories. And like the podcast is all about transformative living, whether it's from health, whether it's financial ruin, whether it's just living, just kicking a life of mediocrity to the curb and pursuing what you're just passionate about most. That's what I stand for in this world is I stand for people who want to transform their life. That's the biggest stand I take in this world. So I love that. Love yeah. That. Pete, at the end of every show, I'd like to ask my guests, what is one piece of advice that has really resonated with you over the years that you would like to gift the audience? It could be absolutely anything. Well, I think that you can have anything in life if you just love people. Wow. That's the biggest thing. And a big Big, big thing is seeking to understand. I think the biggest thing is we all listen with the intent to respond. And if we can listen with the intent to understand what the other person is saying, man, that's a game changer. And I, I've talked about that before with somebody else who said, what's my one nugget that I would leave? And I said, if you can listen to people with the intent to understand what they're saying, instead of waiting to respond, you'll come away with life with such a different perspective on life that it'll mm-hmm. be, life will never be the same. Yeah. Love that. Well, Pete, thank you so much for coming on. This episode was everything I thought it would be and more. Such an inspiring story. Love what you're doing now. You're helping so many people. You're going to continue to help so many people. Thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed this one. Thanks, Kevin. And when you come out to Arizona, please look me up. You got a place to stay. The other thing too, I will support you in any way possible to get across the country on a bike. So, All right. right. (laughs) You're in here first. It's happening. Yep. Yep. All right. Perfect. When you commit to it, let me know and, uh, and I'll be behind you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much and, and have a great one, okay? Let's yes, stay in touch. You too. Thank you everyone for listening. If you enjoy the podcast, subscribe, give us five stars and leave a review. It really helps boost the podcast and spread the good word. My chiropractic practice is located in West Orange, New Jersey at Montclair Upper Cervical Chiropractic. You can also find us on Facebook at Montclair Upper Cervical Chiropractic. All of my information is on my website at drkevinpecka.com, drkevinpecka.com. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel at Dr. Kevin Pekka for podcast episodes, patient testimonials, and educational videos. I have daily affirmations and inspirational quotes on Instagram at Easel Affirmations. E-A-S-E-L affirmations. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at drkevinpecka at gmail.com. drkevinpecka at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Cheers.